So I also have a confession to make. There are times when I am not impressed by our worship service. There are times I'm just, yeah. Sometimes it's because, you know, as Marty mentioned, the song leader may just not be enthusiastic that particular day. Maybe um, we have uh, someone leading the communion who is not prepared. On Sunday nights it may be because you know, we're 150 people in a 450 seat auditorium. Sometimes it could be that the songs and the communion and so on and so forth seem to me that it's kind of getting repetitious. After all, I, I, like you as a Christian, have been doing this same thing every Sunday for, for 38 years. And I have to really, it, this is not a gimmick to get me into the sermon. I really feel, oh boy, this isn't so great. I'm, I'm not you know, very edified. I thought that as a public presentation, our service at times not very dynamic compared to what I have seen and what you have seen on television, or even what I've seen in other churches that I've visited. And I wondered if people out there felt the same way but were just not saying anything. I'm wondering if we were in a small group setting now and I said, I have a confession to make, there are times when I'm not impressed by our service. Sometimes I'm just plain bored. I'm wondering if, a, if in a small group setting, other people will, would say, well, maybe I, I want to make that same confession. Sometimes I'm just, I'm just bored. Sometimes I just wish it was over. Now I told you, I, this isn't a boast, it's a confession. It's a confession. Like I said at the beginning, I'm not happy to feel this way. It's a confession, not an announcement. So as I thought about these things, I asked myself, what can be done to make our worship better? And that is a question that is very human in its nature. How can we make it better? Because men see things that are broken or weak and they want to change them or they want to fix them, especially the male gender. We want to fix stuff. And the more I thought about it, however, the more I realized that it isn't what we do in worship that gives the worship power. It's what's worshiping or praising God, what that does for us. That's what has power. You see, my first impulse as a sinful man is to improve worship in order to give it more power. And being one of the ministers, perhaps I'm in a better position to do that than a member who is not a full-time minister. And so you know, to improve, what do we need? Well, we need better microphones. Or we need to, let's have a training session for song leaders. Let's learn some new songs. Let's, let's teach men how to pray better. Let's be more organized to distribute the communion and on and on and on and on. But you see, this is what the flesh does. It tries to improve the external things in order to improve the spiritual things. And the thinking is if we try harder, we will be more spiritual, we will worship better, we will be more satisfied with our adoration of God. Of course, there's nothing wrong with doing all of these things in worship. You know? I mean, the Bible says we must do things in a decent and orderly way that Paul mentions in 1 Corinthians chapter 1, or 14, rather, verse 40. However, it's not the order in worship that edifies us. It's the worship itself that has the power to bless us and to edify us in Christ. So tonight I'd like to explain what worship, whether it's a group of 600 professional singers 
singing beautifully in a magnificent building with all of the latest technology led by a professional minister, or 160 people spread out in a 450 seat auditorium doing the best they can with songs that perhaps not everybody knows using volunteer worship leaders. I want to try to explain what worship or praise does for us, no matter who you are, no matter how many have gathered in the name of the Lord. First of all, praise focuses our spirit on God. I mean, there's so much distraction in this world. Making a living, making a living, consumes a lot of time. Dealing with the problems of sin and illness and death. The allurements of the world, you know, to consume of this world. It's a distraction. The many changes we are going through as we grow from child to teen to various phases of adulthood and then old age. There is more clamoring for our time and attention and involvement than ever before in the history of mankind. I mean, there are over 4,000 books that are published every single day, every day. The New York Times Sunday edition newspaper contains more information than the average person encountered in a lifetime in the 17th century. In the year 2000, there were 20 million websites. In May of 2015, there were 177 million active websites. Can you imagine? This represents an incredible amount of information and visual and intellectual stimulation. More than one person can take in in an entire lifetime if he stayed awake, reading, watching, listening, absorbing, consuming, all day, all night, he couldn't do it in a lifetime. Too much. So the result of this is that it's difficult to actually experience God's primary command to love Him with our whole heart, our whole soul, our whole body. We are frazzled, we're burned out, we're distracted, we're spaced and disoriented by the constant pounding and shouting for our attention each and every single day. Work, school, home life, friends, Facebook, Twitter, Snapchat, I mean, you know. I have a news service, on, I have an app as a news service on my phone or on my, you know, my iPad. And when I got this free app, the first thing they did is they showed me, they gave me a list of I don't know how many, several hundred publications. New York Times, Time Magazine, Newsweek, BBC, Forbes, you know, whatever, all of these things. And I selected 50 of these several hundred periodicals and so on and so forth. And now every day that news service sends to my phone or to my iPad or whatever I want via this app the top stories that they have gleaned from the 50 periodicals and news sources that I originally selected. This afternoon, for example, I sat down and I pulled out my iPad and I, you know, I clicked on that app and it opened up and it, you know, a little wheel went around for a while there. And then it says, we have 179 new stories for you. 179 new stories. Not just from the same paper, from newspapers and, 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 and media sources all around the world, 179. So when we offer praise, it is the one exercise that draws the mind, the heart, the spirit, and the body in one total action focused completely on God. In Ephesians 5, 18 and 19, Paul says, be filled with the spirit, speaking to one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing and making melody with your heart to God. 
So offering praise is a kind of reset, a kind of refresh. You know how you refresh your computer, reset? Offering praise is a kind of a reset and a refresh button that refocuses your attention on this priority and reorders your mind and body and spirit in such a way that the spirit is filling you and not the world. And so praise focuses us on God in a way that nothing else can. That, that's why we have a midweek service. It's the reset for our lives. We walk out of here, we go to our jobs, our families, you know, everything pulling at us for two, three, four days, you know, and we're out of sync. And that Wednesday service, that short time of conscious effort to focus on God and praise and study and spiritual matters and spiritual relationship seems to bring and realign all of those things back into a proper into a proper relationship with one another. And the fact that less than half the church is here on Wednesday night is proof that we need Wednesday night. <laughs> so praise focuses on God in a way that nothing else can. Secondly, praise provides a witness. When the first evangelists came to Montreal, Lee's my hometown, Lee's and I, where we come from in Quebec, when the first evangelists came to Montreal back in the 1950s, their most powerful evangelistic tool, believe it or not, was singing. They had a chorus that met at a public square in downtown Montreal and they sang and then handed out pamphlets and brochures to invite people to come to a service or a meeting or whatever was going on at the small churches of Christ in the area at the time. Now you need to understand something. They're in Montreal. These people are from either Harding or Fried Hardeman or somewhere, you know, some college. They're singing in English. Montreal is French. People are French Canadians. They don't speak English, especially in the 50s, not as much a cosmopolitan city as it is today. So French people couldn't understand the words, but the sheer power of pure voices singing out praise for God drew their attention, and it also drew their respect. You know, a biblical example of this, of course, while Paul and Silas were in prison, in their darkest moment, it wasn't a healing, it wasn't a sermon that preceded the earthquake that threw open their prison gates. It was the sound of their voices that filled the prison with songs of praise and thanksgiving. Praise to God in the name of Christ is one of the most recognized marks of a Christian by those who do not believe. You know, they may not know our doctrine, they may not be able to distinguish between a Southern Baptist and a disciple of Christ. And you know, they may not know those things, but they know that disciples of Jesus Christ are people who praise Him and honor Him in song and prayer and regular worship. You know, it's interesting to note that outsiders do not consider us faithful Christians if we don't regularly worship God and praise Him. Not what brethren think of us, what unbelievers think of us. It's not the only sign, but praise is a significant witness that we are sincere Christians to the outside world. You know, it's hard to convince an unbeliever that you are a sincere Christian if they never see you worship the God that you say you believe in love on a regular basis. So praise focuses the spirit. Praise provides a witness. And thirdly, praise creates unity. You see, you cannot argue with someone you're singing with. You have a hard time hating the person whose voice is lifted up in songs of love and devotion to the Lord next to your voice, offering up the same words of love and devotion to the Lord. In mission fields, 
One of the best ways to break down social barriers with people who would not normally associate with each other, you know, in other places, black and white, or people from different tribes, the way to get them together is to get them to sing together. Now that wasn't such a huge problem in Montreal. Here in the United States, you know, the big argument, the big cultural argument, black and white, right? Black and white, black and white. In Montreal, it's not black and white. In Montreal, it's English French. It's English French. You know, I got beat up because I was English, but I also got beat up because I had an Italian name, so I, mean, I don't know how that works, but anyways. And one of the most powerful unifying factors in the work in Montreal was to get the English and the French who had been converted to sing together. So in our worship service, there'd be one song being French and the French would be singing and the English would be doing their best to kind of muddle through. You know, and then the next song would be you know, in English and now it's the French that had to kind of muddle through the song. You know, we, we went back and forth. And it was a way of you know, stitching together a kind of unity there, slowly, one song at a time. While praising God there is, as Paul says, neither Jew nor Gentile, neither slave nor free, neither male nor female, all are one in Christ Jesus, Galatians 3.28. As a matter of fact, praise is the one action that we do that connects us to the angels and the spirits who surround God's throne and who are praising Him always. Revelation 5.11. So when we praise, we unite with all the believers in the world and the angels and the spirits in heaven who are continually worshiping God into eternity. And all of us, all of us, for that very special moment, all of us become one. And so I remind you as you lead prayers and as you lead singing, that the angels are watching, my brothers. So what are we doing here this evening? It's not just singing some songs and enjoying fellowship. We are engaging in one of the most powerful spiritual exercises that God has designed for man. It wasn't designed for Him, it was designed for us. Because praise is the power to realign our spirit with God's spirit. You know, the bumps of life put us out of alignment. Worship is the thing that puts us back into alignment. Praise is a powerful way to confess our faith to the world and guarantee that Christ is confessing our name in heaven. And praise has the power to overcome the boundaries of race and class, even the barrier that divides the spiritual world from the physical world. That barrier is erased when we all bow to the Lamb and offer our praise in song and prayer. And so, I repent of my feelings of discouragement. I repent of my negative attitude concerning our worship as I realize that all these things are happening as we worship God this evening. So let us therefore sing and let us pray and let us glorify our God with sincerity and love and unity and confidence.